sweetie. So we need to talk about your grades, young lady. Oh, really? You do need math in the real world. Am I having this conversation with you? Excuse me, who are you talking to? Wow. Not another word. Don't you dare. Don't. Eastern Hills, good morning. Hey, so glad that you are here with us as part of your weekend. Uh, this is a busy weekend for uh, a lot of people, so we're so glad that you're here with us. I want to just start by asking you a question, and uh, man, how many of you have ever asked a woman if she was due and then found out she's not even pregnant. Anybody that happened to you? Yep, yep. Um, I think on average for us guys, we probably do that once in our life and I am way above average. Like I, I just don't know, I, sometimes I just can't stop myself. Even like on Friday, uh, Thursday at graduation, I, I saw this teacher and I was like, oh, oh, no, no, don't say anything. Like I think you might be pregnant, but I'm not even gonna go there. So, uh, because we all have that, right? We've all had that where we've said something that the minute it's coming out of our mouth, we wish we could get it back. Uh, but once we say words, it's very tough to get them back. In fact, it's impossible. Now, God, God gave us a button that is very helpful. God gave us this button. And that is a super helpful button. But it would have been even better if he gave us this button. Because sometimes when we don't pause, we wish that we could rewind and we could go back. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to jump into our time together here this morning. God, thank you for today. Thank you for a beautiful, sunshiny day, a fun weekend to celebrate graduates, also a chance to remember people that gave their lives so that we could have this freedom to be here this morning. And Lord, I just pray that this morning as we talk about our tongue and our big mouth, that you would just help us. You would help us because this is something that is not easy, uh, not easy to get control over. So God, we need your help this morning. We love you. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. So to get everyone caught up, if you weren't here last week, we are in week two of a series called Me and My Big Mouth. And last week I made everyone say that together, me and my big mouth, because it is not the person sitting next to you in their big mouth. Don't be nudging during this service, okay? This is about you, this is about me and our big mouth. And we said that the overarching idea of this series <coughs> is that we wanna, be, we wanna be quick to listen and slow to speak. And we even did some hand motions last week. We're quick to listen and slow to speak. Because here's the deal, in conflict, in arguments, in heated discussions, whatever you want to call it, they're the two people that are in that conflict, that are in that discussion, that are running their mouths, they both want the exact same thing. We want to be heard and we want to be understood. But the only way that you can learn about that other person, the only way that you can hear them and truly understand them is if you are quick to listen and slow to speak. If you want to catch the rest of it, you can go to our YouTube channel, the website, check it out. It'll set you up for the rest of this series that we're in for the next few weeks. But this week, I want to talk to you about the fact that words are powerful. Words are so powerful. In fact, your life has been shaped. My life has been shaped. We've all been shaped by the words, the words that were spoken to us, the words that were spoken maybe over us or prayed over us, and the words that were spoken about us, maybe that we didn't know until later. Words, they shaped our childhood experiences. Words are currently shaping the relationships that we're in today. Words, they impact your self-confidence. Words impact the view of yourself when you look in the mirror. 
We've probably all seen people who, who had little to no self-confidence, but they gained confidence because of the words that were spoken over them. And we've all seen people that had a ton of confidence, but their confidence was erased because of words that were spoken to them. And the thing that makes this so fascinating, so challenging, is that the words we receive, the words spoken to us, those words aren't equally weighted, right? How many positive words do you have to say to someone to make up for a negative word or a negative comment that was given to them? Researchers have done a lot of research and they've come up with a number. I don't know how you figured this out, but they've come up with a number, it's five to one. So five positive words for every one negative thing that's said to you. <clears throat> now, we rarely, we rarely forget the hurtful words that are said to us, right? I mean, for, they just have a tendency to stick in our hearts and to stick in our minds. And we just remember hurtful words and, and at the same time, we rarely remember encouraging words that are spoken to us. I don't know if you, you have this. I have this where, and maybe you do too, where you can remember a time in your life where somebody, maybe your mom, your dad, your grandparent, a mentor, a coach, they sat you down and they said something like this. They said, what I'm about to say to you is so important. Never forget what I'm about to tell you. And, and if you're like me, you remember that conversation. You remember like, being there and, and like, this is an important thing. Like my grandfather's about to tell me something. I can't remember what they said after that point, right? It's like those encouraging things. We forget them, but we always remember the hurtful words, the criticism, the sarcasm, the mean, hurtful things. We remember those because the words are not equally weighted and not not only are words not weighted the same, but the source, the source of those words isn't weighted the same. If you hear words from your coworker, they're 50 pound words, right? They don't, they don't feel like anything, they're just not a big deal. It's like picking up a pillow, big deal. Not a big thing when someone from one of your coworkers says something. Your boss's words, they weigh about 150 pounds, right? They weigh a lot more. There's some weight to those words that your, your boss says. Like if, if the 50 pound words was like a bird, like the, the 150 pound, that's like they just, a dog, right? Like it's, it's heavier, right? It's a bigger thing. But then have you noticed that the closer people are in relationship to you, how much more their perception of you, the words that they speak to you, how much more weight those carry. Whether it's positive things they're saying or negative things, they just, they just have more weight. Like when your mom, your mom's words, your mom's words are heavy, like 500 pounds. It's like a horse, right? Like they are big. Like when mom says something, good or bad, you, you don't mess around, right? And then dads, like dads, it, it, I don't know why this is the case, but dads, our words, our words weigh the most. And, and that's not like a pride thing, like, yeah, they do. You know, like, no, no, that's a warning to each and every one of us. Dads, our words weigh the most. I remember years ago, I was down at Socks Place. Socks Place is a, a ministry in downtown Denver. They're a financial partner of ours. We support them. You can work with them during a four-hour service week. And uh, it's, a, it's a homeless teens drop-in shelter. So each day they come by and they get food and they can hang out. And we were there on a Saturday morning cooking breakfast and just kind of hanging out. And we were shooting pool and one of the girls that was there uh, who had come in off the streets, she said, what's, what's your tattoo on your arm? And I showed her the tattoo on my arm and I said, oh, it's, it's my wife's and three kids' um, initials at the time. And, uh, and she goes, oh, man, I wish somebody loved me enough to put my initials on their arm in a tattoo. And I said, oh, oh, you know what? I am so sorry, but we love you. <laughs> Everyone here loves you. God loves you. The people at Sox Place love you. And she goes, oh, no, 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 I know all that. I know all that. But man, it would just mean so much 
if my dad would tell me that he loved me? Like, oof, right? Like, our words weigh so much. But perhaps, perhaps maybe the most overlooked part of of how much words matter and how powerful they are is this dynamic. And it kind of goes like this. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. No, yes, they can. That is not true, okay? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because words, they can totally hurt us. And the truth is that recovery time isn't equally weighted from the words that we hear. And if somebody says something hurtful to you, (coughs) it hurts immediately. But the recovery time from that hurt takes time. There is no more words or apologies that can immediately heal or recover the person that you said that to. And this is why it's so ridiculous when we say this. Teenagers... I think they maybe say this more than anybody, but we all say stuff like this. We say, but I'm said I'm sorry, right? Like, like the implication is that why aren't you okay, right? I, uh, why aren't we good? Why aren't we back to the way it should be? Like I said, I was sorry. Yes, I said something stupid. Your feelings got hurt. You called me out on it. But then I said, I'm sorry. Like we should be good now. And I mean, here's the thing. If the same reason that if I accidentally slammed your hand in the door of my car, Right? And then I opened up the car door and you pulled your mangled fingers out of my door. And I was like, I'm sorry. Right? And you're like, yep, I understand that, but we still have to go to the emergency room. Because believe it or not, I'm sorry does not heal broken fingers. So we have to go have a doctor take care of that. Our words can hurt. And our words don't immediately make things better. They are not equally weighted. So... We want to be quick to listen and slow to speak because when we're listening, we're not using our words. Our words are the most powerful thing that we have. In fact, you can do more damage with your words than with any other part of your body. Like, think about this. You can totally destroy a person with words and you don't even have to be in the same location as them. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, and we talked a little bit about James last week and what that meant, but I mean, think about that. The brother of Jesus, like no pressure, bro. Like you got big shoes to fill as you're growing up. But anyways, James, he wrote this really practical letter to the early church, to the first followers of Jesus. And in it, he has a lot to say about the power of words. It's where the quick to listen, slow to speak came from. But now later on, he's in the beginning of chapter three, he begins the discussion this way. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Nothing is truer. That is very true. But catch this next statement. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. So, so we all stumble in many ways, but anybody who controls their mouth is perfect. Well, what does, he mean, what does he mean by perfect? Let's keep reading. They are able to keep their entire body in check. That's how powerful your words are, right? Like James goes on and he gives us a couple of examples. He says this, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal Now, this would have been very common for them, uh, something people were really familiar with. They rode horses back in biblical days, and and, and a bit that they would put in a horse's mouth, basically a bar that would go across their mouth and and kind of like into their cheeks, right? I don't know if a horse has cheeks, but whatever, horse cheeks, you know? And uh, today we call it a bridle, and one each side, the reins connect to that piece. So you can pull and like stop the horse. You can like pull one way or the other and like turn the horse. And in fact, like, I don't know if you've seen this, but like little, little kids, three, four years old, can get up on a horse, a ginormous animal, and ride that horse and control that animal just because of the little bit that's in its mouth. Okay, you don't like horses, James says, let's talk about boats. Here's the deal. Uh, Take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Now, here, here's a drawing of an ancient uh, Roman merchant ship, right? Uh, and and this, this ship would actually probably carry 50 to 100 
passengers, uh, cargo down below. This, this sail would take on incredible winds, be thrown around in the storms. But this part right here is the rudder. This, this little part is what steers this huge ship. So small part, big influence. A bridle in a horse's mouth, the rudder on a ship. Then James goes on, he says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Okay, let's, let's take that, t- that thing about the tongue first. Think about that, how small your tongue is in relationship to the rest of your body. It, it's, it's so small, yet your tongue can control the direction of your life, can control the quality of your life. And then James goes on and he gives us one more example. He says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, probably no one that he's talking to there has ever seen a forest fire. So they're having to imagine, like, we know what a forest is. Oh, my goodness, a little spark could burn the whole forest down. And they're like, that, man, that sounds crazy. Now, here, we are from Colorado, and we understand and we know <coughs> we don't have to imagine this. Thousands of acres burning at a time. Millions of dollars in homes and real estate being destroyed. And it's such an incredible illustration that James gives us. That something so small, right? Something so small, just like this. This little flame can cause a huge forest fire. There there should be no logical correlation between these things, right? Something so small should not have such power. The tongue in our mouth, though, our words, all of those things, the tongue, it says, also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. Now, next week, You have to come back next week because next week we are gonna talk about all the unbelievable potential good that your mouth can do, that your tongue, the words that they can say. But this week, we're focused on the negative, unfortunately. So your tongue, your mouth has potential for endless evil, James says. See, every kind of evil can be initiated by it. Murder can be initiated because of an argument. A divorce can be initiated by what you say. Wars have been started over words. But James says the mouth, the tongue, the words that we say, it actually has power to corrupt the entire body. Think about that. We all have an illustration in our heads about ways that our mouth got us into trouble. But it didn't just get our mouth in trouble, it got our entire body in trouble, right? Like as a parent, you don't take your little kid who mouths off and put their mouth in timeout, you put their whole body in timeout, (laughs) right? A teenager, when they talk back, you don't ground their mouth, you ground the whole teenager. You fire the whole person, not just their mouth. A principal will expel the whole student, not just their mouth. But the way James says it, he says, your mouth has the potential to get your entire body in trouble because your mouth and the words that you use determine the direction of your entire life. He says it has the potential, and he goes back to this fire imagery. He says it has the potential to set the course of one's entire life on fire. In other words, we have the potential, I have the potential to burn down a relationship with my words, to burn down my marriage with my words, burn down my relationship with my kids and with my friends with my words, burn down my career and my future with my words. I could stand up here and I could say really stupid things this weekend, and you know who would stand up here next weekend? The elders, and they would say, remember Kendall? He doesn't work here anymore, right? Like that's the power that our mouth has. And the truth is, like this is a little bit convicting, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a lot convicting if we're, if we're being honest. Some of us, some of us has scorched the people we love the most with our words. Our kids, our kids, why, why, would, we, why would we scorch our kids with our words? These, these people that we hope, that we hope 
we have the greatest relationships with for the rest of our lives. And we scorch them with mean things, with sarcasm and our words. And like I said, it's convicting, but here's the deal. When we are confronted or when we convicted, how do we respond? Here's how we normally respond. We defend ourselves. And how do we defend ourselves? With more words, right? James says, quick to listen, slow to speak. And we're like, I'm just gonna keep talking, right? And we say things like, well, I was just, I was just being honest. Well, I was just mad. Well, I was drunk. Well, I didn't mean it. Here, here's one of the favorites in my house. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's never gonna be followed by something nice, by the way. But the truth is, if you start a fire accidentally, and we figured this out, we've learned the hard, some people have learned the hard way here in Colorado. You leave your campfire unattended, you throw your cigarette butt out, and they find out it's you. You are responsible for the fire that you started. And in the same way, if you start a fire with your words, even if it's on accident, you're still responsible for the fire. Then, it's like as if we haven't gone deep enough, James is like, he takes us to the very, very bottom. And he says this, he says, this fire that you started, this, this thing you said, and going back to the verse, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and he finishes this way, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, when he says hell here, he's not talking about like the place of torment, like eternity. He's, he's talking about the source of evil. It's like he's saying, he's saying, there's this thing inside of you. The devil literally made you do it. Sometimes you might say something, you're like, I wonder where that came from. Oh my gosh, I'm not a terrible person. Well, it came from within you. Because there's something in you and it's evil. It's our, it's our sinful nature that we're all born with and it has potential to do extraordinary harm and the way that it does that most of the time is through the words that we speak. I'm like, well, thanks, James. This is a super uplifting verse for us to work through on a Sunday morning. Can we move on? And he says, no, no, you can't. Here we go, next verse. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. You can't control it. It will never be fully under control. There will always be an unpredictable factor about our mouths, about our words. They must always be guarded. We need to be quick to listen and slow to speak because our tongue, it's volatile. It should come with a warning label. And then, and then James, he, he, goes, he goes, I just wanna illustrate to you how crazy this is. Like, this doesn't make any sense. He says, some of you, and, and, and I'm, I'm gonna say some of you and probably me, right? This, this very morning, we're guilty of what he's about to say. And if not, you will be by the time you go to bed tonight. But he says this, he says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. With the same tongue, with, with our mouth, we praise our Lord and Father. Then we turn right around and we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness, right? It's, it's like you come to church on a Sunday morning and you sing all these great songs. You know, we, we love Jesus, yes we do, we love Jesus, how about you? We didn't sing that one this morning, but you know, like, and, and everything's cool and everything's great. And then you get in the car on the way home and the minute you get in the car, <laughs> right? Or you get to the restaurant after church and, and one minute you're saying how much you love God. And the very next minute, you're talking about the people that God loves like they're not even human. And man, I, please hear me, this sermon is preached this way as much as it is this way. But here's the deal. We're so demeaning at times. We can be so critical, so toxic, so sarcastic. Out of the same mouth come both praise and cursing. And then, and then James kind of like leans in and he says, Brothers and sisters, he says, this should not be. Yeah, really, it should not be. And then he asks the question, can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? I'm sure the people sitting there are like, well, 
Obviously, no. <laughs> we, we don't see anywhere else in nature where, where two opposite things can come from the same source. Like, it's never been done before. Like, I mean, this is li- literally kind of a miraculous thing that our mouth can do praising and cursing. And he says, yet my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James is trying to show us there is something uniquely disturbing about our mouth, about our tongue, about the words that we say. Okay, got it, James. Then what comes next? The end. That's it. He just finishes, he stops, he goes on to another point, he, he goes on to another topic. Well, what do we do about it? <laughs> like, what should we do? Like, what's next? But he doesn't give us anything. And I think that maybe James is trying to make this point that there is no once and for all solution. There's no, like, once you learn this, then you're done. Or once you mature, then you're done. Once you get to this age, then you're done. No, this is a forever thing. This is a constant potential for great good, but a constant potential for extraordinary evil. Your mouth can determine the quality of your life, the direction and quality of your family, the direction and quality of your children, the direction and quality of your roommate, the people around you, the people you work with, the people you work for. He says this is a really big deal and you're never safe. It is a constant thing that has to be guarded. That's why it's quick to listen, slow to speak. So, James, he helps us realize what the problem is, that it's a big deal, but then he kind of leaves us hanging. So I've got three words, three words that might help us. It goes like this. The first one is remember. Remember. Remember you are a powerful person because you can use your words to help people or you can use your words to hurt people. And, and when you are a little bit angry, a little bit frustrated, you have unlimited power for evil, potential for evil to come out of your mouth. So remember, remember that words are extremely powerful. Don't forget that. Second word, surrender. Now, this is such a big deal. And we have the potential to burn down the relationships and burn down the people we love the most. Some of us, we've been scorched by other people, so we've already developed some habits of how to come back and how we respond. But we need to surrender this part of our body to our Heavenly Father. I I think maybe it could even look like this. It could could mean waking up in the morning and, and offering a prayer and saying, God, I need your help. I know that my tongue can get me into trouble. The words that I say can get me into unlimited trouble. Please, today, God, help me to guard my tongue. Help me to control the words that come out of my mouth. And God, I am going to surrender that to you today. I am going to do my best work to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I think that would help. I think us just being conscious of that and surrendering that part of our body to God every morning would be helpful. Then the third one is this, confess. This is when you mess up, right? And you're going to mess up. Because like I said, this doesn't go away. This isn't something that you move past, that you mature out of. It's something that you have to manage your whole life. So when you mess up, and you will, don't explain, don't make excuses. Own the fires that you started with your words. Own the scorching sarcasm that's been a habit your whole life and stop. There's no place, maybe you've heard this before, there's no place for sarcasm in family. There's no place for sarcasm in marriage. There's no place for sarcasm in parenting. And I gotta be honest, 
I am terrible at this. Because when you, when you say something sarcastic, everybody chuckles, everybody laughs, it's funny. But you have wounded someone with your sarcasm. I have wounded many people with my sarcasm. So confess it immediately and work to break that habit. Now there's some groups of us that I wanna talk to you as we close. First one is dads. Dads, as I said earlier, I don't know why, but our words, our words are the hottest and the heaviest that anyone hears. Remember that. Remember that. And choose your words carefully. Kids, that's all of us, by the way, right? If you're in this room, if you're watching online, you have parents or you had parents. Our words to our parents are the heaviest words our parents will ever hear. And we don't believe that, right? Because we say, oh, it's just my mom. Well, there's no such thing as just your mom. There's no such thing as just my dad. Regardless of your age, your words matter to your parents. Ladies, us guys, we, we look like we're tough. Like we can handle anything. We laugh when we're criticized. But our egos are so fragile. Guard your words. Men, come on men. Honor women with your words. The women in your life, the women at work, any women that you come into contact with. Just decide, just decide that I am going to honor women when women are around. And I'm going to honor women when women aren't around and it's only guys around. That's the world that you wanna live in, men. That's the world you want your daughters and your granddaughters to grow up in. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And last thing, for those of you, for those of you who grew up in homes, or grew up in environments where words were used against you, where you were burned over and over and over again by somebody's words. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. No one, no one should grow up that way. So for the sake of the next generation, don't repeat that cycle. And, and you will be tempted to, in, in fact, you, more than a temptation, you will be inclined to repeat that process. You probably have already heard words coming out of your mouth and thought, well, where did that come from? The very same thing I heard from my, my father, my mother, my grandfather, my uncle, whoever it was, those very same words coming out of my mouth. You know where it comes from. Don't repeat that cycle, decide. Decide that you're gonna break it because words are powerful. And our, our mouth cannot be tamed. It can only be guarded. And by God's grace, only by God's grace and some thoughtfulness on our part can we control it. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for this challenge, for this reminder this morning about the words that we use, how powerful they are, how much they impact and affect lives of the people around us, our families, our kids, our parents. Now this week, as we go throughout our week, again, will we be quick to listen, slow to speak? Yeah, do we just do everything in our power to guard our tongue? We surrender them to you. We ask for your help in all of this. Lord, we love you, we need you. We pray these things in your name.